Okay, Job chapter 33. Looking at Elihu speaking now. Job and his three friends have hushed. Elihu speaks up and he's going to be the right one of the, of the group. Wherefore, I, wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken all my words. Listen to me. And this will be going from chapter 33 to 37. After Elihu, God's going to speak. Behold, now I have opened my mouth. My tongue has spoken in my mouth. Sounds like a proverb he's starting to speak. My word shall be of the uprightness of my heart. What I'm saying is upright. Now we have seen and we have proved and God's going to prove that Job's three friends have been wrong. And Elihu's already said that. He said, according to what the three friends that Job has been speaking, my heart is upright. It's almost like maybe Elihu's been praying during this whole time. Waiting for that moment, can I speak, God? And my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. You'll find a reference in Nehemiah 8, 7, and 13. Speaking clearly. The Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, has made me. Okay, we've studied the scripture that says, In the beginning God created. We find in John chapter 1, Jesus Christ was from the beginning, and he created. Now we see the Holy Spirit in the creation work. And the Bible says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And in verse 2, you see the Spirit move. That Trinity, they are one together. It's not God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. All three. And all three were part of the creation. And the breath of the Almighty, Genesis 2, 7, has given me light. So Elihu doesn't speak for evolution. I am a product of God. I am a product of the Holy Spirit. If thou canst answer me, <clears throat> you're talking to Job, set thy words in order before me, stand up. All right, you're going to give me the answer, stand up, and you better get those words right. That's what the order, it doesn't mean one, two, three, A, B, C. It means you put those words in, in order, stand up, and then speak. Let yourself be heard. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. Job would say, I want God to speak to me, and I end up with these idiots speaking to me. Oh, if God would speak to me, if God would show me, and lie who stands up and says, it's me. God's going to inspire me. Yeah, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, Elihu's going to speak for God, but they're moved by the Holy Spirit. And we know by the Spirit of Elihu speaking of God, he believes in creation. He believes in God. I also am formed out of clay. I'm a man. And God's using me. That's inspiration. And when people say to you, eh, men wrote the Bible, yeah, men wrote textbooks too. And men wrote your comic books that you can understand. And what I tell them, I say, yeah, man wrote the Bible, the pen is man, and the ink is the Holy Spirit. God breathed, that's what inspiration means. As, as God breathed into man, God breathed into man to write the word of God out of the Holy Spirit. Behold, and so what Elihu is saying, man of clay, I'm just an ordinary man that God uses. And that's what uh, all the writers of the 66 books, many writers, more than 66 writers, that's what they're just plain men who sinned against God, all have sinned, and God used them. There's no pedestal. And he says in verse 22 or 32, and there's no flattering titles. God, I'm just sitting here, God's using me. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid. Neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee, as his friends were. You're going to hell, Job. You're going to hell, Job. This is all because of your fault. That's not what he's going to do. He's going to speak the truth. And where the truth lies is where it's going to be. Surely thou hast spoken in my hearing. And I have heard the voice of thy words, saying. Now he's going to, he's going to put forth Job in his words. 
And we're going to see Job, he's justifying himself. I am clean without transgression, said Job. Well, that's not true. I am innocent. Neither is there any iniquity in me. And that's self-righteousness. And Job has said to that point, you know, if my if I've joined another, let my wife. If I if I've done my fields wrong, then if I have not given to, to clothes to the to those who are naked, if I'm not fed to hungry, if I'm not taking care, look, look at all the stuff I've done. Behold, he God finds an occasion against me. He counts me for his enemy. This is Job still blame talking, and he's blaming God. And he's blaming God with evil, Elihu says. He has finally the case against me. He counts me as his enemy. But I'm innocent. I have no iniquity. I have not sinned. I have no transgression. And God, look what God's done to me. And many men do that. He, God, puts my feet, Job's feet, in the stocks and marks all my paths. <coughs> look at what the evil God's done to me. And Job has gone so far to say that. And God doesn't do it. We know Job 1 and 2, the devil set forth to it. But we know that God uses the devil for, for the chastising of man. And Job is a sinner. Job is sin. All sin. Behold, in this thou, Job, art not just. Why, who's speaking again? I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Job, who do you think you are? You're not just. You're not innocent. You're guilty. And God is greater than, God is better than you are, Job. Get yourself off your pedestal. Step down and repent. Why does thou strive against him? Job, why are you fighting against God? For he, God, giveth not account of any of his men. God does not have to answer to anybody. God, how dare you do it? Why are you doing this, God? Who gives you the right? He's God. He's almighty. He's holy. He's righteous. He doesn't lie. He doesn't commit an injury. There's no sin in him. He has all right. And he might be doing what he's doing for the greater good of us. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth not. <laughs> We have been five to six years at the farmer's market here in Daytona. And I've spoken as, as much Saturday as I can be down there. And there are people down there outright just wicked and vile and they won't come to God. There are people there who, you know, oh, I love God and they won't come forth and come out and serve them. And I've spoken more than twice. Now, this is how God speaks in the Old Testament. This is not the New Testament. This is not on this side of 66 books in our laps. But I'm not going to limit God, God the Father. But when we do have the dreams and we do have the ideas, we do have the vision, we've got to check the scriptures. We got to, If the scriptures say it's okay, then it's right. If the scriptures nullify what we think and what we do and what we, our actions think, then it's no good. It's garbage. But as far as the Old Testament, in a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon man, in sub slumberings, slumbering, upon the bed, when a man is fast asleep in his bed, not when he's at work, not when he's sitting around, not at a traffic light, then he, God, opens the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. So a man is asleep. And God opens his ears and opens him. Says, I, I, this is what I want you to do. This is, this is what I have for you. And there's been many a message I'm going to say. I don't think this defies the script. There's been many a message. That in the middle of the night I woke up. Wow, that's a great message. I'll remember in the morning. No, I won't. I have lost a lot of messages because I didn't write it down, get up and go write it down. I think that's where God said, hey, 
Now you're listening. Now you're not in your sin. Now you ain't got pride. Now you got no distractions. Hey, here's a good message. And I've blown it. That he, God, may withdraw man for his purpose and hide pride from the man. So what is Elihu like saying? God may speak to us. I'm not going to limit God, but he speaks to us in 66 books. And if God speaks to you and it aligns with the scriptures, study to show thyself a prudent and a good, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly divided where it's true. If you have a vision or a thought in the middle of the night and it aligns with the scriptures, God says, hey, I got this for you. And he, he got, what did God say to you, dear? I didn't even know he talked to me. But the Bible says he spoke to you in the middle of the night. Yeah, and God says, I sealed it up. To get rid of the pride. What, what's that? God spoke to me in the middle of the night. God told me. And that's exactly what man would do. Yeah. And you see a lot of television and radio. God spoke to me last night. There was a man. I have a dream. I have a dream. And the insurance companies got nervous. Mm -hmm. Where that man went with his dream, it caused firebombing, it caused destruction, it caused a theft, it caused his insurance to pay out. That was not holy, that's not right. And you go ahead and put reverend on his name. You go ahead and name him after my, a man that, that, that nailed the thesis on the church door and just cleaned up the Catholic church with his own church ways. Luther had a Catholic church cleaned up, that's what he had. Not everybody has a dream that is a true dream of the Bible. You have to take those dreams that that man says and put it to the Bible. He hides up the pride. That's why he closes a vision. There are some men out there. God speaks to me. I'm the man of the pulpit. I'm the man of the Bible. You listen to me. Foolishness. Pride is a sin. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from the perishing by the sword, death and hell. God has that power. The same God that may talk to you in the middle of the night that you won't remember, he's the one that saves our soul. He's the one that doesn't have you go to hell if you've done what he told him. He's the one that will send you to hell when you don't do what he tells you to do. God has that power. He chastens also with pain upon his bed. And a multitude of his bones and strong pain. Now remember, he's speaking to a man who has from the head of his crown to the soles of his feet boils, painful boils, Job 2 says. And I'm going to tell you something right now, and don't you dare say, I am saying that God causes it because it's not always true. But one of the things that may cause your pain and your suffering Maybe because God's speaking to you. It can be also the devil trying to destroy you and stop you. It may be your own fault. All right, here you go. You step out in the middle of the road. You don't look both ways. You get hit by a Greyhound bus. You're in the hospital. I think God did this to me. No, you were stupid. You didn't look both ways. All right. You're out doing you're out doing what the Bible tells you to do. And then you get sick. Oh, I guess God's trying to stop me. No, it may be the devil trying to stop you. It may be God trying to show you a sin in your life. Maybe God getting your attention some way. It's God, the devil, and you. And we have a place in the Bible where it says, the devil caused David to number the people. And then another place in the Bible says, God caused David to number the people. And when we come to the conclusion of Job, and we pass on to the book of Psalms, as far as my study, I don't ever see where Job learned what really happened to his life. Now, I don't know if the book of Job is the earliest book in the Bible. I don't know if the book of Job was written. To Job, yeah. Hey, I got your book here. Well, let me read it. Oh, well, that's interesting. I don't know if Job ever had a book of Job to read it. As far as I see, I don't think Job ever learned what happened in Job 1 and 2. That the devil, I don't think Job ever realized that God spoke well of him and the devil says, oh yeah, let me add him. And that God's thinking, okay, yeah, Job has a sin in his life and you're the only one that can reveal that sin. Go do it. We have seen Job's sin play out. He's not innocent. 
But we cannot say God did it. You know, it says in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist is going to call fire from heaven. Don't you say every tornado is an act of God. Though the insurance companies say it. It may be the devil. I don't know where man would come in that, but who knows? Maybe man has the technology to cause storm. I don't know. I want those conspiracies. Verse 20. So that his life, man's life, adoreth bread, and his soul daintly me. Have you ever been so sick that you don't want to eat? Have you ever just been so ill, so much pain? Get, get out of here. I, I, I mean, no, there, well, there it is. And lie who's saying God. It can be also the devil. When, when Jesus is in this ministry, here comes an old woman bent over in pain. And I think he said 12 years. I, I'm not sure. But she's bowed over. And they're like, you can't heal her on the Sabbath. He goes, listen, that daughter of Abraham has been afflicted by the devil all these years. It may be the devil trying to break you. It may be God saying, will you just stop and listen to me? Will you speak to me? Will you ask me what the trouble is? Asa had disease in his feet, and the Bible says it was painful, and he went to the worldly doctors and didn't go to God. There's a woman in the Bible, again, she spent all her living on the doctors. Finally, she came to Jesus, and when she finally came to Jesus, she, <coughs> she was healed. There were people in the Jesus ministry that were possessed of the devils. And the Bible, there are probably things that came to Jesus because John said there were more things written than there were ever, I mean, there were more things that happened than were written. There are probably people that came to Jesus to be healed and it was their own fault. Or no fault at all. A man was born blind. And the disciples said, who did that? His father or his mother, the sin. Jesus says, neither. It may be just because it's in your body. But it looks like for Job, he's in pain. He's got pain in his bones and he's not eating. That's what He's speaking to Job. His flesh is consumed away. That would match Job's condition. Job's body has been infected by boils and infection. And pus and blood and oozing and goozing and shooting out of pus. That it cannot be seen. I don't know what that would be. Unless Job is actually missing pieces of his body. You're looking at his arm, there should be, you know, muscle there, and there is no muscle. And it would almost claim to weight loss. And his bones that were not seen stick out. Ouch! And if we're talking about Job, it looks like the boils have so decayed his skin, you look at it, oh, there's a bone. That's painful. If this boil and the disease of Job has eaten to his skin, it also happens, and not for Job, not for Job, but that also happens with leprosy. And leprosy is a vile disease in the Bible. His flesh is consumed away, leprosy, that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, death, and his life to the destroyers, death, hell. Those Apollyon means destroyer, and he comes out of the bottomless pit. I don't think he's talking to Job. I think he's talking to general man, verse 15 and 16. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, a man of God, a preacher, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. That's a job of the preacher. 
Here's a man, he's suffering, he's in agony, he's in pain, life has afflicted him, he's going to die, he's going to hell, he's going to the destroyer. What does God do? Does God send a healing? No. Does God give him medicine to relieve him? No. God sends a preacher. And Romans chapter 10 says, how wonderful are the feet that bring the glad tidings. You're dying, going to hell. What's God going to do you to give you relief? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's not what I want. I want you to give me a beer. I want you to give me medicine. I ain't going to relieve you in hell. And many times as we've gone through the kings and the chronicles and, the, and Samuel, we have seen kings where God has sent a man to him. This is how you get right. And they put him in jail or kill him. One man said, yeah, that man of God, I hate him because he speaks evil of me. And the guy spoke good. It's just the king didn't like the message. And it's something that needs to be heard. When God sends a man to you with the word of God, who is correct, you need to give here. I would hate to have that man come back to the judgment seat of, of Christ and say, well, I never knew. Well, let me call my man that I sent you. Here's the answer that you wanted. Well, he didn't come in an alcohol bottle. <laughs> He didn't come in the form of a prescription. That guy was just yelling, angry, and all that. He, and he preached Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's exactly what I, that's exactly what you needed. Oh, so you mean if I receive Jesus Christ, all my all my, all my my infirmities will go away. I get rid of all my diseases. I get rid of all my no. No. You may get more. All they live God in Christ Jesus up. Suffer. You may get more suffering. Well, that does me no good. What about when you get the new body? No more sin, no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more departing, no more goodbye. Forever to be like Jesus Christ in a brand new body. How's that? Or you can go to hell and get a body that torment. As I said today at the farmer's market, there are no tears in heaven. There's no tears in hell. In hell, you would take that tear and cool your tongue. You can't. You may not want to listen to the preacher that preach right with God. You may want to listen to Satan's preacher, but it ain't no good. Look at number 24. And 23 on is a very important message in the Old Testament, by the way. Then he, then he is gracious unto him, saith, deliver him from going down to the pit, hell, that have found a ransom. That ransom today is Jesus Christ. Not in Job's time. Not before Calvary's cross. The ransom comes after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to scriptures. It's amazing to find the gospel laid out in the book of Job. This will also be when you go into tribulation period. You will still need Jesus to save you, but you've got to have the law and the works and Jesus. So you have the ransom in 24. You have the revelation in 23. Revelation. Here comes the man telling you what, what God speaks to you. Verse 24. Here's the ransom of God. Jesus. As far as the Old Testament. And we're not in the law. But Job brought an offering to God for his sons. I guarantee he brought an offering for him. And the law would be you bring a lamp. You bring a goat. You bring a cattle. You bring something that God told you to bring. That's a ransom. And that would prepare you one day for the Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. Now here comes the regeneration, verse 25. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. That will be the Christian in New Jerusalem. That will be the Jew in the new earth. That will be the Gentiles in the new heavens. You're going to have a body that's more fresher than a child. It amazes me. I'm 51 years old, and I can sort of remember all the things of my childhood that every time I had a boo-boo, it didn't hurt. I'd go in there, I'd be bleeding, gushing blood, get my mom on a pan, she'd get the band-aids and, and, and that red stuff that burned like crazy, and I'd be, doesn't that hurt? No. And you go out and do something more stupider. And today I put my finger down, the, ow, that hurts. 
I get up. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> as you get older, you feel more pain than you were as a child. And that fresh as a child, it looked no wrinkles as I got today. I look at pictures of me as a child. I was a sweet looking good child. Look at me today. What on earth happened? Sin. And we're going to have a fresher child. You know why? Because there's no sin in heaven. There's no age wines. There's no wrinkles. There's no death. There's nothing to destroy the body in New Jerusalem. He shall return to the days of his youth. You know, when we go to New Jerusalem, we don't ever age again. And there are some that believe we'll be 33 and a half years old as the time of Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Could be. But we don't age. I know that. We don't have happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, you idiot. Happy birthday. We don't do that in heaven. We celebrate the new birth. How come churches don't celebrate the new birth of Christians? Why do they celebrate the birth of when you were born in sin? Of your mother as the days as the spark flies upward. Why do churches do that? Why do you celebrate the day that you were born into sin? Why don't they ever celebrate the new birth? In heaven, it's always going to be about the new birth. Because the day I had my new birth is the day I've been adopted by God to be his child. And forever that new birth, we will be in glory. And we'll never age. Forever. Reconciliation, verse 26. He shall pray unto God. And he, God, will be favorable unto him. And he shall... See his face with joy, and he, God, shall render unto man his righteousness. He, he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that the righteousness of God, that we, no, he, he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God that I have is Jesus Christ alone. That is First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians five twenty one, right there in the Old Testament, a prophecy of Jesus Christ and Him giving me His righteousness. And God will see the face the day I got saved. All of heaven's interest, God said, "Wait a minute, hold on, I got to go down seven seven three Broad Street because there's someone calling upon my son to be saved." And God saw my face and the tears I had and the love I had for him and the faith I had in him. God says, here I am. And the Bible says where two or three had gathered together and there was like four or five people in that room that day I received. There was Jesus Christ and there's God's like, I see you. And I confess my sins. I know that. And he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. He washed all my sins away. And at that point, I got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He looketh upon man. This is repentance. And if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which is right, and it profits me not. There's repentance. That is what's missing in the modern church today, repentance. And there it is in the Old Testament, the book of Job. You must repent. You just can't say, Jesus, receive me, and please, Jesus, save me. So I can just go about wonderfully in my wonderful great life that I have. It ain't going to work. You got to turn or burn. The old man used to say. I have sinned. You got to be careful because King Saul said it many times. I have sinned. And he kept doing it. I have sinned. He kept doing it. And he had no love for God. You got to have that righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit that, Lord God, I hate my sin. I want to turn from my sin. God, I have sinned against you, David said. Salvation, verse 28. And he will deliver his soul from the going into the pit. So the pit is hell. That's the pit. And his life shall see the light. Now who's the light in John chapter 1? Jesus. There is the gospel message in Job chapter 33. Without the gospel even happening yet. If you repent of your sins, then you will be having your soul delivered from the hell. 
and you will forever to be with the light. And Revelation 21 said, a place that there's no need of the sun, no need of the moon, no need of the star, for the Lamb shall be the light of it. There it is. This is the first book in the Bible in order. And you see the book of Revelation spelled out here. You see the book of Romans spelled out here. You see the end of the Gospels spelled out in Job. Don't tell me you don't see. If you don't see Jesus in chapter 30, 30, 30 what? 30, what? At what age was Jesus? 33. That's interesting. The age of Jesus in the chapter that we find the testimony of Jesus. And we're not done. Verse 29. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. God has never stopped. God is long suffering. He's not willing that any should pay. God has sent men all over the world. Go out there and preach the same gospel, preach the same Jesus. And there are people getting saved. And there will be people saved in the tribulation period by doing the law and believing Jesus in faith. There will be people in the millennium that will do right and believe on Jesus. And there will be people in the millennium that will not. When the devil's freed, he gets an army from somewhere. I don't understand that, but he gets an army. But people will come out of the millennium and will go off into the new earth. I mean, new heavens. Or earth. To bring back his soul from the pit. Hell. And enlightened with the light. There's that light again of the living. Jesus said I am the light. I am the light that liveth. I am the water of light. I am the bread of life. We're talking about Jesus. To bring his soul back from the pit. Alright let's look at that as far as. Not hell. But let's look at that as far as the grave. What is that? That's resurrection. My body won't go into hell. If the Lord tarries, my body will go in the grave. And when the rapture happens, my body's going up. It don't stay. So you got death in, in the resurrection right here. Mark well, O Job. Hearken unto me. Hold thy peace. Be quiet. It's almost like Job was going to say something at that moment. Job, shut up. I ain't done. And you know, have you ever witnessed to somebody, and I have this many, 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 you're telling them about Jesus, you're telling them about stuff, and they're going to say something stupid. And a lot of people say, you cut people off all the time. Now, I don't want them to say anything stupid. I don't want to interrupt what we're talking about important. You know that woman at the well did that? Jesus explains to her, and he's the bread of life. He's the wonder of life. He gave her a little prophecy, but she's not married. And she's, well, our father's worship in this mountain. Your father. No, she's like, no, listen, no, you didn't get it right. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. Forget about mountains. You know what she did? She, you know, tried to upset the preacher a little bit. And the preacher is Jesus. Moses did that with God. I want you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people... Well, Lord, I'm not elegant. I can't speak. You shut up. Who made your mouth? And people do that. And people will do that. I've had it many times. You deal with somebody. and I stop them. I don't care. It's, I, I stop many people. May I shouldn't, but that's my texture. I don't want you to go say anything stupid. I don't want you to get us off track. It's so easy to get off track. And when you're dealing with Jehovah Witnesses, you got to shut them up. Because they'll try to get you away from the scriptures. Mark well, Job, hearken to me. Hold thy peace and I will speak. If thou, Job, has anything to say, answer me. Okay, now speak. Speak. For I desire to just... He's like, Job was going to say something. Okay, Job, shut up. Listen. Okay, now, Job, you can speak. If not, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace and I shall teach thee wisdom. So you know what Elihu does, unlike the three friends? All right, Job, I've given you a little thing about life. I've given you revelation, ransom, regeneration. I've given you recognition. I've given you repentance. I've given you salvation. I've given you resurrection. Shut up. Let me finish. All right, I'm done right now. You got anything to say? You got anything to say? And you know, that's how you witness to somebody. You give them the gospel. You split, no, no, shh, listen, listen, this is what the Bible says. If you ever sin, oh, you, no, the Bible says all have sinned. 
Have you ever lied? The Bible says that, you know, thou shalt not bear fall. I mean, have you ever cheated your family? Have you ever done that? Oh, you have. And you go with them through the Bible and you will ask them questions as you're witnessing to them with the script. And then say, have you, have you, do you ever? And you say, okay, speak. But you don't let them go off on a bunny trail. That's proper in witnessing. And I have, you know, I've come to say, have you ever sinned? Okay, and I'll open up the Bible. Well, and I'll say, well, well, no, we'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later if we have time. And then we'll move to the next step. And then, is this you what I'm talking about in the Bible? I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes him should not perish. Have it. And I'll say, I want you to read that verse, but when you come to whosoever, I want you to put your name there. Why would you not? Just please read the verse. When, at that point there, put your name. And then, you know, you can't let them overpower the conversation because the devil will drive them away. Remember, when the sword of the sea went out, the, the first thing that showed up was the devil grabbing the seed, grabbing the word. You don't want the devil to grab that word while you've got somebody who's listening and adhering to the Bible. you got to kick that bird if you know what I'm talking about. If you know the Bible, study the Bible, you know exactly what I mean by kicking that bird. Don't give the devil opportunity to steal the word. And by having someone talk too much, can get the word out. And that's not good. 